Good afternoon and good evening to our uh, speakers and audience who are connecting with us from different places of the world and maybe inside the uh, a country. So welcome to the US Afghanistan conundrum paradigm shift or business as usual webinar hosted by Afghan and Institute for Strategic Studies. My name is Nazila Jamshidi and I work in the field of social and gender justice. I know an area that demand being tough and amidst all these numerous challenges. But even tougher than myself are my panelists who have continued to work, advocate, and lead efforts for a better future uh, for a nation that entire the world has yet to fully understand and support. So for months, many Afghans and friends of Afghanistan have waited to see who will become the 47th president of the United States, a nation upon which Afghans have heavily relied for development of their society, a better quality of life, progress for women and minorities right. And as Afghan Americans, we recognize, and Americans, we recognize how global events can reach our shores someday and impacting us very, very deeply. So it's a source of pride for all of us as Afghan, as Afghan American and Americans that the United States has often felt morally and of course strategically obligated to respond to the crisis beyond its border. So today we are joining by a distinguished panel of, of former diplomats, veterans, scholars who have invested their expertise, time, and resources into making Afghanistan a more stable society. And together we are exploring how changes in the United States political landscape and the shift in the new administration may offer opportunities for Afghans within the country and Afghan diaspora abroad. So thank you for joining us for this critical conversation, everyone, both panelists and the audiences, and everyone who's watching us online. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Annie uh, Forzheimer, a former career diplomat with the U.S. Department of State, who will share her insight. Annie, thank you so much for consistently advocating for human rights, democracy, and stability in Afghanistan. We as Afghan community truly appreciate uh, your work and effort you are doing and being such a strong voice and advocate for the cause of Afghan and uh, Afghan diaspora community. And as we look into coming months, as you know, we, have, we will have President Trump at the White House. And President Trump, is the one who initiated the Doha agreement with the Taliban in 2019 and also has frequently criticized President Biden for his withdrawal strategy, stating that the situation in Afghanistan would have been so much different under his leadership in 2021. So given this context, do you think Afghanistan still holds any strategic significance for President Trump? And would his approach, whether diplomatically or economically, offer a better path for uh, for Afghan moving forward. Over to you, Annie, and you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation. I actually don't think I will need or take 10 minutes uh, to start this off, and I want to hear from everyone else. Um, I don't believe that Afghanistan under this administration is going to take on any kind of new importance. Um, I think that the words uh, that were expressed about condemning the withdrawal strategy of President Biden were words that were politically convenient during the election campaign. But I don't believe that um, the Trump administration had any other plan for the end game uh, other than what uh, President Biden undertook. So it was it was all but done uh, as of January of 2021. Um, as you know, as you know from everything I've written and everything that you know, there there were other options available to President Biden. He didn't have to do what he did. However, the way that it was left by the Trump administration was very indicative that they would have 
withdrawn all US forces on a roughly similar time frame. Um, I don't see at this point that there's particular interest in Afghanistan. Um, actually don't know that um, there will be any, any kind of deviation in the current policy. Uh, if possible, there may actually be a worsening in the sense of cutting uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, which is something that the Republicans who control the purse strings in the Congress have indicated is a possibility. Um, the most recent report from the Special Investigator General, for example, and other strong allegations indicate that there is misuse of humanitarian assistance by the Taliban. And certainly there's not going to be a lot of tolerance in a very restrictive um, foreign assistance environment for aid that cannot be said to be getting to the people who need it. Uh, there will be, in my opinion, uh, absolutely no chance of there being another special envoy for Afghanistan. Um, there's no particular you know, need for one in, I think, the minds of the people who are taking over. There isn't one right now. And you would have the issue continue to be mainstreamed into the South Asia, Central Asia part of the State Department, Defense Department, and White House. Um, Going forward, there are decision points that are mainly um, going to be taking place at the UN. And what will the US tell its um, mission at the UN to vote for or against? Uh, I think that the issue of gender apartheid is going to take a while. And I don't actually think that this administration will change the position about you know, whether or not gender apartheid should be uh, declared a crime against humanity. However, I don't think they will be a constructive uh, player in the negotiation of that treaty. With respect to a future Doha process, um, the U.S. will probably participate in whatever happens, but is very unlikely to consider itself to be the architect of it. Um, and I would hope that the U.S. will continue to hold the line on two important elements. One is the continuation of the work of the sanctions monitoring team, which is up for renewal next month, still under the Biden administration. And the other is the continued denial of U.N. credentials to the Taliban uh, because on the grounds that they are illegitimate representatives of the country of Afghanistan. I, I basically think that out of, you know, <laughs> inertia or lack of, you know, new thoughts that the coming administration will probably continue both of those policies. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, the word that keeps getting used about the um, Trump administration is transactional. And so I think that that is what Afghanistan should expect. In every way, it would be, in my opinion, a mistake to look to the United States to take anything like a, a version of moral leadership on the issue of Afghanistan in the coming uh, months and years. But I actually think it would have been a mistake to expect that even now. Uh, Afghans are best able to argue their own case uh, in terms of setting the, the you know united set of demands and requests, what is it that is needed from the whole international community? And that is best coming from Afghans and not from the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Since we have a little bit of more time with you, I'd like to ask this following, uh, following question from you. So uh, basically, you believe that the new administration or this uh, political uh, shift in the United States poses a zero chance uh, for uh, 
changing the situation in Afghanistan or the relationship with the Taliban. So and another concern that I hear from a lot of women here in Washington is about the office of uh, uh, Madam Amiri. I know it has been kind of symbolic in last three years, uh, but at least uh, she was pre she was attending some meetings and like uh, she was uh, presenting or voicing her countries or her government uh, position related to the Taliban. So what do you think about that office? What would happen to that? And how it can be handled a little bit better in, who, in, in the new administration? Um, honestly, I don't think the office is going to exist. Um, it's not the kind of area that I believe that this administration is going to interest itself in. Um, and it's not normal. There is not normally such a job. Um, so if, as happened in the first Trump administration, they they sort of get rid of many of the special envoys that had uh, proliferated, this uh, function would go away. And um, I, I think that's the most likely thing to happen. And when you say that things are not going to change, I mean, I'm afraid I think some things will get worse. Um, I'm a very concerned about the the plight of Afghans who are here under humanitarian parole or other forms of refuge. I'm very, very concerned about about them under this administration. I hear you, Annie. There are a lot of concerns related to that here in among Afghan diaspora community. So thank you so much, Annie. Uh, uh, you, as a, again, as I said, you have been always such an, a strong advocate for Afghan women's rights, for democracy in Afghanistan, and so many other. So before hearing from other panelists, I would like to continue this conversation with another former former diplomat, uh, Ms. Nazifa Hakpal, who served at. Afghanistan Embassy in London. So, uh, Ms. Harpal, uh, as you know, President Trump's uh, policy on Afghanistan would most likely impact British and the EU strategies, as they usually, their approach to Afghanistan is often influenced by uh, US policies. So, and of course, the degree of alignment could vary based on the President Trump's specific policies and his level of engagement in Afghanistan and his approaches to dealing with the Taliban. And a lot of analysts uh, talk about some potential scenarios, and I hear uh, a lot nowadays uh, uh, about them and some implication. And one is, I mean, something that I hear from a lot of analysts is increased isolation of the Taliban regime. So if President Trump adopts a hardline stance, imposing kind of like, you know, new sanction or completely isolating the Taliban without diplomatic engagement. And um, so tell us what would have been the response from Britain and the EU, considering the differences at a stock, of course. Well, thank you so much for, um, for first having us and conducting this webinar. Uh, very delighted and honored to be uh, speaking among my fellow esteemed panelists. Um, regarding your question, I think it is too early to predict that uh, if President Trump may adopt a hardline stance, such as imposing further sanctions uh, or pursuing full isolation of the Taliban. Um, I've been hearing uh, other projectable scenarios, for example, uh, America may decide to look at Afghanistan through the prism of uh, countering Russia and China, uh, which this may be pay the way for um, pave the way for conditional engagement with the Taliban. Um, for example, uh, U.S. may pressurize the Taliban that. Uh, um, just to maintain with these two actors their relationship based on uh, on, on the U.S. interest. And um, they will just uh, forget about the issue of human rights and women's rights, and they will let this to be internally decided. Or even we sometimes hear from analysts that uh, this feature of President Thomas, and he mentioned that he, his mind is more 
transactionals, he may uh, go for uh, recognitions of the Taliban um, because we have already seen his um, expression and views with regards to Europe uh, that uh, he emphasized that if Europe pays more for its defense, uh, then um, it may stay, or the or or he, or the or uh, the U.S. West would, would stay with NATO. So even like talking with leaders such as with uh, Russia itself, it's it seems like you know that he will um, uh, deal with the um, Western values or. Uh, so the, the, this at this kind of situation, it's very difficult that there will be more sanctions. But however, um, um, I will try to um, answer your question, assuming that if there is more sanctions and full isolation of the Taliban, um, how Britain in EU will respond. So we understand that it's a very different situation at the moment we live. There are different threats in, in terms of international security, in terms of international relations. Um, and uh, of course, the vision of uh, President Trump itself, it's very different to his predecessors. Uh, this definitely um, affects um, the UK and uh, the EU and US allyship. We hear a lot of analysis here in London and from um, there was also just two days ago a meeting in Budapest. Um, um, we um, hear or listen to uh, President Macron's uh, statements. Um, we also saw, as Annie mentioned, that uh, Trump uh, has just very vague um, um, expressions or mention of Afghanistan during his campaign, just in two or three uh, issues, mainly um, criticizing irresponsible withdrawal or um, leaving behind uh, 80 billions. And now it's say even it's not 80 billions, but whatever contradiction in terms of worth of these weapons that are ammunitions are. Uh, but he seems to be interested in Bagram Air Base. And we don't know that uh, whether it was um, just an election campaign or it was rather a policy issue. So there's a lot of things that uh, time may tell us. Um, and uh, of course, it's very difficult to predict. Uh, so there is a lot of ambiguity in terms of uh, not only Afghanistan, but also towards other countries uh, and his foreign policy is said to be very um, unpredictable. Um, when looking retrospectively during the peace talks with the Taliban, signing a deal um, with the Taliban, withdrawal of troops, um, we have been uh, witness that EU and Britain followed similar policies uh, of the US and they supported it, although it was during Biden and Trump administration, but generally they did. Uh, so I think also it's important before examining that how the future will unfold under President Trump's second uh, presidency. Uh, we can also see a kind of nuanced look uh, into um, the UK and EU uh, current policy in terms of Afghanistan. Uh, and then we will be able to draw a conclusion from it. For example, um, we have been witnessing that the EU uh, has its embassy open in Kabul um, and their level of engagement is very different to the UK and also to the US with the Taliban. Um, similarly, uh, we can also see there is alignment between the UK and EU in terms of um, humanitarian aid assistance for Afghanistan. Um, but of course, there are also divergence in terms of uh, human rights, uh, particularly women's rights. Um, we have uh, seen that you know the UK has not taken any step to hold the Taliban accountable. Instead, they have pursued uh, conditional engagement with the Taliban. While recently, we are witnessing that the UK, the EU, uh, is taking more uh, principle-based approach. And that is with the two or three instances. For example, um, it was, um, I think, September or uh, 
think it was in September that the EU uh, Parliament um, passed a resolution demanded for gender apartheid to be codified. Um, or they have also passed um, European Court of Justice. They passed a ruling um, uh, that Afghan women should be granted asylum based on gender uh, and nationality. Or the, another very important uh, step that um, Germany and the Netherlands, uh, alongside uh, Canada and Australia, uh, took it was that they announced that they will uh, initiate a litigation against the Taliban in ICJ, uh, bringing CEDAW case against the state of Afghanistan. So, however, we know that, of course, these things happened during the President uh, Biden administration. Uh, while today it's uh, different and uh, President Trump's approach towards EU and Britain would definitely affect um, uh, these two um, EU countries and Britain's uh, stance towards Afghanistan. Um, but assume that if President Trump um, adopts a hard stance regarding the Taliban, I believe um, the EU and Britain will pursue a different position. Uh, and it's because of their vulnerability from Afghanistan. Um, I think their policies to, to some extent will align but at the same time, uh, I think they will be kind of revolve around three key issues. Uh, of course, at the moment, uh, security and terrorism menace are important for the EU and to the UK as well. And I think um, particularly in terms of refugee influx, they are uh, much more worried about it. And we hear here and most of the time from public, from um, analysts, um, and that's why human rights um, or addressing human rights violations in humanitarian crisis um, might be important for these countries, or despite that uh, President Trump, uh, if he um, adopt more um, hardline uh, kind of stance, but I think they will not, uh, because if President Trump uh, disconnect from NATO, in any circumstances, either withdrawal or decreasing its involvement. Um, I think um, despite that the EU countries and uh, Britain, they have its political and uh, military fragmentation, but I think their focus still would be on their own continent, countering Russia, um, addressing Ukraine crisis, um, rather than meddling in Asia or in Afghanistan. So, to conclude, I think it is very difficult to see that what exact strategy um, e the, the EU and Britain will take. It remains to be seen. Uh, it will depend on the varying degree of interest and threats level from Afghanistan, such as the fact uh, if um, in, in, in an instance of destabilize Afghanistan or the region, uh, of course, the, tra the threat level will be first to the EU, particularly in terms of uh, refugee influx. And we have seen that the refugee influx have been increased and in uh, in, uh, particularly this year, uh, was it uh, IOM that announced 80, uh, 8 million people left and most of them taking very dangerous journeys to the Europe uh, and particularly um, to the UK as well, although they have uh, imposing many um, restrictions in terms of their border security, but still they cannot avoid it. So I think in conclusion, I can um, predict that if there is um, hard uh, sanction or um, or isolation of, uh, of, of, of the Taliban by the US, um, the scenario that you are um, predicting or you're posing in your question, I think the UK and uh, the EU uh, will remain um, uh, in a kind of conditional engagement with the Taliban. Um, of course, I think they will not be able to address uh, or engage without the leadership of the US in terms of security and diplomatic issues, but definitely humanitarian and human rights will be 
um, one of the priority, while at the same time, the EU will hold the Taliban accountable through, the, through those three mechanisms that have already been started. Uh, but the UK will try to more focus on humanitarian aid. Yeah. Uh, well, th thank you, uh, Madam Hapal. Uh, so taking this opportunity, I would like to ask this uh, follow-up question. Um, I mean, I, I understand it was very difficult to predict who will be the 47th president of the United States. Just, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, it was absolutely very, very difficult to tell. Uh, and uh, this is mainly because of the situation or the two party things in the US. But I wanted to, um, ask this question, and I think it should be important for other audiences to know how Afghan community, Afghan diaspora community in based in UK was preparing for the kind of a response for changing or bringing a shift into their advocacy work, into their uh, uh, lobby kind of work, uh, how they were kind of like, you know, preparing for the change for like, you know, whether it's like President Trump administration or uh, a President Harris, I mean, Harris administration? I mean, of course, for the UK diaspora, um, mostly they are concerned with the change of government here in the UK. Um, and when here, Labour Party uh, won the election and they have also majority at the parliament, uh, this was a good opportunity for them. So it was more, the focus was the here uh, with the government as well as with the, the um, parliament. But of course, is a country like the United States that has a global impact on all countries, um, the diaspora community, um, they, uh, similar to many other Afghans, uh, they were more interested into uh, Trump's administration, although um, they have not a good memory of signing the deal with the Taliban, but because of his firm leadership, because of um, ending war this slogan or at least when they when he discussed the um bagram air base this was something giving hope to many afghans that maybe he will be able to decide the fate of afghanistan or at least um would uh, kind of you know of course there are many other dynamic in the region uh, particularly in terms of China, or uh, he might be tough on uh, Pakistan, or he might be tough on Iran. Uh, and uh, these kind of analysis stems from, uh, you know, that historical memory that diaspora community uh, have um, uh, from um, under the circumstances that they lived in Pakistan, or they have seen that how Pakistan has played uh, in terms of uh, um, Afghanistan. But of course, in terms of advocacy work, um, the diaspora community's focus is mainly here, um, but they would be more like kind of observing, watching, analyzing uh, its effect on, uh, on the relationship and how the outlook of the Trump administration might be for our region. Because of course, Afghanistan's um, uh, location in geography uh, is is key still. Uh, although we know that there is not a lot of attention, but it could change uh, any time. Uh, and Afghans, they know that this is a key factor that can play uh, a role uh, for bringing a change, uh, particularly in terms of regime change, particularly in terms of we want a democratic government. We want that that government should be based on the will of people. So this is something that um, Afghan community here always try for it and are mindful for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so, so far we have heard from potential policies from the US, EU or zero policy or not 
any policy at all on Afghanistan in 2025 and of course beyond. Now I think it's such a good transition to talk about how these policies can be influenced. What are some opportunities for those who want to see like a little bit better Afghanistan than its current version uh, or to have influence in those uh, policies? So uh, let's now turn to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Jason Chris Hawk, who brings over 30 years of experience in national security, including defense, diplomacy, and intelligence roles. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, in this webinar, again, uh, as I said and always say it, Afghan community, I mean, they appreciate uh, your work and your commitment to Afghanistan greatly. You are such a strong voice for our community. So as discussed by other um, speakers, the United States retains several strategic interests in Afghanistan, including like, you know, counterterrorism, national security, regional stability, and kind of like, you know, great power competition, and even humanitarian and human rights concern, right? So given these interests, what potential avenues do you see for Afghan diaspora, think tanks, or those organizations focused on Afghanistan to influence the US policies and potentially the world toward Afghanistan? Over to you, Jason, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, there's a great Napoleon quote that uh, in, a, in a war, you can lose time and you can lose space or you can lose part of the battleground. You can recover the space, but you can't get the time back. And I think that's what's going to be the real problem uh, for the people of Afghanistan and those in diaspora and those who care about it. Uh, three and a half years have been lost um, of infighting, really, where it could have been some kind of political organization uh, an exile that could go in and speak on behalf of all of the people of Afghanistan as a majority uh, view. But there's been some work on it. It didn't reach where it needed to reach, probably, uh, to make this something Trump would even look at. And I think there are a lot of big goals. And then I'll, I'll go into some of the kind of who can do what. But the first big goal, you've got to get the Trump administration to care about Afghanistan. That's going to be a challenge. I totally agree with Annie. This is not a big topic. I was in the last presidential transition when he took over from Obama. Um, Afghanistan was one little policy paper that was floating around during the whole two months of preparation. Um, and we had a lot of troops on the ground at the time. Now we have nothing. So I, I don't know how you're really going to get his attention unless you get the attention of some of his key advisors. Um, probably the counterterrorism angle is going to be your best I agree with Annie. I don't think it's going to be a humanitarian human rights angle. Um, so second big goal, you've got to get some members of Congress to care. It will take money uh, to be allocated towards trying to continue to help Afghanistan. Uh, and there are a lot of veterans in Congress right now uh, that have served in Afghanistan. You might be able to find some inroads there. It's a time to continue to influence for a wiser policy. People should be writing, people should be doing interviews, continue to talk, talk to other countries, help to solidify an international policy, if not a U.S. policy. Um, I think uh, one of the most important ways you're going to make this rise to the top, and that's to get another special envoy. That's going to be challenging. Annie is absolutely right. They were cleaned out the last time there was a trade over. They're not normal positions. Without one, I think it's going to be really hard for the Trump administration to keep up with what's going on with Afghanistan or for the United States to help lead any international efforts. So we might not be leading any international efforts. You've got to go find some, some allies who are willing to, you know, can you push on the UK or Germany or France, um, Canada, Australia, you're going to have to look around for that. I think um, for, for Afghans, clearly I mentioned it already, but getting behind one politically inclusive body um, so that you have some tangible uh, organization to speak with diplomats and to pull the attention and the focus away from the Taliban. That's probably going to be the most important thing. Um, that allows some weakening of the Taliban and the Haqqani regime diplomatically uh, and even economically. I, I think there will be some economic crunch because there will be some some uh, some cutting of aid and things that are going to that country right now. 
because of the misuse by the by the terrorist regime. So prepare for that. There are probably some other ways that Afghans can pressure the Taliban. Um, and I'll talk about those in a minute. There's probably going to be a chance to, uh, there should be a chance to get any more U.S. citizens or any that are even held hostage or in prisons. Um, you could push for that avenue because that is something this administration has said they care about. If they care about it enough to, to take any kind of action, that that's we shall see. The counterterrorism angle, you know, pushing to capture the wanted terrorists, those with bounties on their heads. Um, you might be able to get kind of that law and order uh, counterterrorism view on this. Uh, that would weaken the Taliban regime. As we know, a lot of them are in that camp. But this is it's all a lot of work. And then the final you know, big goal, you've got to get Pakistan to stop supporting terrorist groups in the region. That's going to be a challenge. We we've haven't done it very well through four presidents coming up on the fifth president who gets a shot at it uh, since September 11th. He did push a little harder on Pakistan at the beginning of his administration, but he let his foot off the gas. Uh, so you might have a chance in that. Again, it's a foreign policy issue, and I just don't think this administration is going to be looking at foreign policy as a key issue. This is this was one on the economy, uh, one on border security. I've already seen that's what they're putting their efforts into. So this is going to be a tough one. For the diaspora, talk to people inside and outside of the country. Find out what they want as a future government. Find out what's wrong and be loud about amplifying their voices. You have the best chance as the Taliban tighten their grip. Again, time and space. Diasporas have a limited amount of time to be effective before they will naturally melt into the country they're in. They have to take care of their families. They have to put their kids to school. They have to take care of all those issues. So the diaspora is a limited time issue. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of that left. Uh, make sure you're sharing all those findings that you have through all sorts of media outlets, especially uh, media outlets that might be read inside the White House. There's a whole set of other media uh, that you need to swing to now before we were aiming at the media that would be read by the a Democratic White House. So you've got to be smart about who you're talking to now. Um, organizing. I think the diaspora has the greatest lead in helping the refugees and those who are um, inside the country still to organize around some kind of issue. So that that can be something the diaspora can be doing. They should be talking to veterans. They should be talking to Congress, uh, talk to the administration members if they can. Uh, those are all critical pieces. For think tanks and other organizations, I, I think at this point, no one's probably listening to you inside the U.S. policymaking world, but you can help Afghans to organize. You can help Afghans to tell their story don't make it your story. What is their story? What What is happening to them? Uh, don't speak for them. Amplify their voices. Uh, we can, you know, in that community, think tanks and other organizations, push diplomats to talk to any of the Taliban's opposition. That sh that's something we can make an impact on, where we might not push very hard in the U.S., and there might not be many U.S. diplomats to meet with them anyways. We can push other diplomats and other nations around the world to talk to the opposition. There are plenty of opposition groups. If you can help them get together, organize, and uh, create a, some kind of a ability to speak better with diplomats, I think that's important. Uh, and then you still, you've still you got veterans groups out there in all the NATO nations. There are veterans groups who are still struggling and reeling with the, the mental health impacts of how we left Afghanistan and what happened to our partners and what's still happening to our partners. So. Uh, I think veterans groups have some big obligations right now. There are some large ones. Some of them have a lot of money. Some have a lot of power in the capitals. They should continue to care for Afghanistan's veterans uh, and their refugees and help them, you know, those who are already out of the side of the country, ensure they are safe and secure and they are becoming a part of the community. Um, they can; Those veterans groups absolutely can talk to Congress. They do it every day uh, about the need for a better policy on Afghanistan. No one's probably going to have a stronger voice in, in the Congress than veterans groups speaking to those members, especially those who served in Afghanistan, to say, hey, there are some tangible things that will come out of fixing the Afghanistan policy. One, it's going to help our veterans' mental health in America to know what's going on. It can restore some uh, of the honor and dignity lost by our Defense Department, by our military. Uh, we just need to have some accountability and, and talk about that and figure out a better way to, to deal with it. 
And then, of course, veterans groups should be amplifying Afghan voices. Um, I always try to make sure we're doing that wherever I work. Um, so I, I think that's something we can all do. There's plenty of work to be done. Uh, it's not like the people of Afghanistan usually face easy problems. They always face the most complicated and difficult problems in the world. They're in a bad neighborhood and the world doesn't do a great job of helping them deal with that. So uh, this is not something new. The people of Afghanistan will will persevere and figure this out somehow. And you have a lot of allies, you know, continue to lean on them, on us, uh, and we'll see what we can do. But uh, I don't have a super optimistic hope that we're gonna make a giant impact uh, in this administration as we made almost zero impact in the last. They're, both parties are kind of happy to not be in Afghanistan on the ground. Uh, so it's a small sliver of both sides of the big parties here uh, that care about it, but doesn't mean we don't try. Uh, I just think the uh, expectations should be realistic. Get what we can out of it. Push the rest of the world if we can't push America um, and see what, what we can do. Uh, thank you, Jason. So uh, speaking of allies and supporter, I'm an advocate myself and I see a lot of concern among the a uh, group of advocates here in uh, Washington and, or DMV. So in your opinion, who are three greatest allies and supporter of Afghan women advocate in the United States and within the new administration to whom we should reach out more and we, sh we should uh, keep our connection with? Uh, I would definitely hit the veterans groups. Um, most, most of those veterans who are uh, in the congressional side, there's kind of a, a veterans caucus in there. Um, talk to them. All of them have daughters and mothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. Um, they, they care about that aspect. That's not the military's job, but those veterans in Congress do get that and they will care. And I, I hear from them when I post things uh, about what's going on with women's rights. I hear from people, whether it's in private spaces or in public spaces where I talk and speak. Um, so there is a still a big group in, in D.C. There's definitely um, think tanks that are out there that, that champion this. Uh, and we should continue to work with them if they can have any effect at the United Nations or the ICC. Uh, those those are important pieces. Uh, and the press, you know, is, is one of those bodies. It's bigger and diverse now more than it used to be. But I think this is an issue that resonates with all the press, the tr mistreatment uh, of women in Afghanistan. It's just beyond the pale to most everybody. So um, I would use those important pieces and can, can just continue to educate and push and talk and share videos and share photographs um, and engage with people. If, if you don't, it won't, it won't uh, change. Inside the administration, I don't know yet. I mean, his, his chief of staff uh, has just been named. So you're going to see other people following that. Uh, they're figuring out now who will come in. As they come in, you, you can kind of gauge where they're going to fit on that that position, but I don't know any offhand right now. It's a little bit op opaque. Uh, who's going into what? Thank you. That was awesome, and I hope we have enough advocate among the audience who can benefit from uh, all these insights. So, on this topic, I uh, also want to uh, invite uh, Dr. Aryan Sharifi, an Afghan scholar and also a lecturer and associate research scholar at Princeton University a School of Public and International Affairs, to share some insight. So, Dr. Aryan Sharifi, a stability in Afghanistan impacts the broader regional balance, and you know that far better than me. So, particularly concerning the U.S. interest in containing the influence of uh, China, Russia, Iran, and some other countries. And Afghanistan as shares, it shares border with several key players. The U.S. should be concerned about how these countries might fill the vacuum left by the withdrawal. So having said that, China also, I mean, has shown interest in Afghanistan natural resources and infrastructure projects, while Russia and Iran seek to extend their own influences. So Dr. Sharifi, tell us about how the U.S. can maintain 
uh, an indirect presence, such as through diplomatic, economic influence, or whatever you know, to kind of counterbalance the growing footprint of these powers. So, uh, and also, of course, uh, uh, avoiding by avoiding taking any kind of action that legitimizes a regime which is so, so cruel to women and its uh, citizens. Over to you, Dr. Sharifi. Well, thank you, uh, Nazila John, for, for the event and for including me in this really great panel. I have an immense amount of respect for literally everybody on this panel. I've known their works for years and I've followed them for many years. So it's an honor to be here. Uh, now on your question, uh, to a very large extent, I sort of share the pessimism that Annie and, and Jason really provided. I mean, the, the, the views they provided are very realistic. They may not uh, be, you know, exciting, but that is really what it is. And, and, and Jason really outlined some of the very specific ways that at least uh, Afghans, uh, Afghan diasporas in the United States could at least try certain things. Um, but um, specifically, very short answer to your questions, I don't think it is possible for the United States to really counterbalance the influence of China or Russia or Iran or any other power in Afghanistan, unless it really has some presence in Afghanistan, the United States. I, I really don't think it can do it without having at least a minimal footprint, diplomatic and perhaps intelligence coverage there. Coverage there. Um, now, uh, to do so, uh, despite the fact that I do share the pessimism, as I said, uh, there are at least three reasons that give me some limited level of hope that the United States might actually, this next administration, might move towards building or regaining a little bit of that limited diplomatic and intelligence footprint in Afghanistan uh, so that it could actually do what it wants to do in terms of counterbalancing those influences as well as other objectives that it may have. Now, reason number one is uh, that the current administration, the Biden administration's really policy towards Afghanistan over the past three and a half years has been to have a no policy. <laughs> and, and I think to a very large extent that is, uh, you know, driven by President Biden's personal views on Afghanistan. To be very frank, and non-diplomatic, he never really liked Afghanistan. I mean, his comments going back uh, to, to 2010, 2011 was that, you know, his views were more, in my, in my personal assessment, more uh, the views shared by Pakistan towards Afghanistan than really a realistic assessment of what Afghanistan and Afghans really are. He has consistently said that Afghanistan can never be an independent country, that it's a tribal society, that this and that. So his personal views really has driven to a good extent what the U.S. has really not done over the past three and a half years in Afghanistan. Now, with the change of administration, this gives me a little bit of hope that maybe new people will, will, will change this. Reason number two is that the United States still has some interests at stake there. Now, it may not be very big and major interests, but there are some interests in there. Now, it, it has the moral obligations, not only towards Afghans, but also towards Americans. The thousands of lives that were lost and billions of dollars that were spent there. So still a sense of moral obligation is, is there. Uh, now, it has, uh, uh, you know, the issue of the prestige of the office of the president of the United States, it is at stake. The Doha Accords were signed by the Taliban and by the United States, and those were, to a good extent, not implemented. The issue of credibility at the international level of the United States is at stake. Uh, so, and, and hard interests, uh, terrorism, drugs, uh, the issue of the influences of China, Russia, Iran, and others are there. So some level of interest is there, and the United States will have some gains from ensuring some presence in Afghanistan. And then finally, the third reason uh, that gives me some hope, limited albeit, is that to gain that, that, that presence in Afghanistan is not going to be very costly for the United States. But I think that the U.S. really, with the bare minimum expenditure, can really assure the defense of its own interests uh, in Afghanistan without really spending much either on, on diplomacy or in uh, treasure or in blood. There. Now, I do believe, and this comes really from my constant interactions with literally everyone really involved in Afghanistan, I'm 
directly on a daily basis in touch with the political oppositions, with the military oppositions at the highest level, but also with the Taliban top leadership as well. I even had, as a researcher, as an independent researcher, had a trip to Afghanistan a couple months ago uh, in which I did meet with some of the top Taliban leaders. So my views are apolitical. It's driven specifically you know, through my, my, my research. Now, having said that, I know that the U.S. has leverage uh, now, I know Bell will talk about talk about leverage, so I'm not going to go through that, but I do know diplomatic leverage is there. The Taliban attach an immense amount of importance to engagement with the United States. Really, they do. Uh, the financial and economic leverage is there, and, you know, somewhat the military uh, uh, leverage through the drones uh, as a deterrence effect is there. So, so you put this together, the U.S. can really achieve some level uh, of, of influence there without spending much. Now, what would the U.S. do, in my view, in, in, in that? So if, if let's say, if the, the, the coming president decides to do something about Afghanistan, what would it be? Of course, I do not advocate for a complete isolation of the Taliban. I think it would backfire. It really would backfire. It would push the Taliban further into the arms of the Russians, uh, of the Chinese, and of the, of the Iranians. It really will. And it would get to a point where the you know, where they where the care that the Taliban now have towards the United States will dissipate, and then the U.S. would completely really, you know lose its diplomatic leverage. I do not advocate for that. Of course, the issue of you know military operations is not there. Nobody wants it. I don't think it would work, and I don't think any U.S. president would even entertain the thought of that. Um, what I mean is uh, the conditional engagement that Nasib Ajon talked about. Many of the countries are doing that. In fact, countries in the region are actually engaging non-conditionally. I mean, all countries in the region are, are directly engaging with the Taliban. Even the two countries that have historically been, been opposed to the Taliban, India and Tajikistan, have recently announced that they are going to accept uh, diplomats uh, from the Taliban into uh, their capital. So everybody is engaging. Now, for the U.S., I really propose a, a conditional engagement, conditional engagement based on very specific things that the U.S. would do for the Taliban, and there are very specific things that the Taliban would do based on what the United States would ask them. And to put them together over a specified timeline, this would and could really lead to a situation where we would have a, a constitution-based government in Afghanistan. Now, don't get me wrong, the Taliban are in full control. I mean, that's probably even a positive thing. It, it, you know, the full territorial control has been restored in Afghanistan after almost half a century. Going back to 1978, no government had full territorial control, which is the building block of any functioning nation state, as we all know. The Taliban have that. That's a positive thing. They also seem to be doing pretty good on, on counterterrorism, especially when it gets to uh, countering ISIS. I have a host of uh, achievements that they've done, and it's been verified by independent sources, many countries, other countries. And I can share if anybody would be interested. So turning that into a law-based government would mean that the Taliban would still have the substantial part of that government. And that's okay. But it wouldn't mean that this arbitrary arrest and, and, and the issue of women's rights and the issue of girls' schools, and these are the things that would really need to be brought and it would really need to be imposed. And I do believe that if there is sort of a conditional, credible engagement by the United States, I really do think that the Taliban are willing to start that. Uh, at the moment, they are afraid that if they... If they give up the issue of schools and if they give up the issue of, uh, uh, you know, power sharing and pluralism, limited pluralism and all that, that they would lose the bargaining chips they have because the United States really has not approached them in the manner that would be clear that, OK, I'll give you this and you'll give me that. Uh, I do believe that if the next administration decides to do that, they can really achieve that with the bare minimum of expenses. And I think that would be good both for Afghanistan and for the interests of the United States. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Sharifi. So before we move to the next speaker, I'd like to, I mean, ask you to briefly, just briefly mention, I mean, you, you just said, I mean, some policy is better than no policy at all. Like, you know, I mean, having 
But I would like you to uh, talk a little bit about, like, you know, what if there is just one effective policy that, which is kind of a realistic that Trump administration will take, what would that be, Dr. Sharifi? Just one. It would be to push for a constitution-based uh, government system in Afghanistan, uh, in which uh, the basic rights of the populace, of the women, of girls or men, everybody would be observed, would be accepted, would be given to them. Uh, and that it would also, that the, 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 the government would also be shared with especially technical and experienced Afghans to really go there and build government structures and run them. I think uh, it would have to be realistic to what uh, the Afghan society is. We cannot really, in my view, in a very pragmatic, and it, it may not be a popular view to say, but a very pragmatic view, we cannot really expect a full-blown democratic Western-style liberal system in Afghanistan that is not compatible with with, with what most of our people, unfortunately, believe in and are used to. That might be a gradual thing, but what we tried to do under the Republic uh, for, for 20 years really was not Afghan, and, and which is why, you know, it, it, it really never worked. To be a realistic, at least a rules-based government, a constitution-based government, the uh, insurance of the rule of law based on that constitution. Now, how that constitution would be provided would have to be consultations, uh, again, on the ground, uh, how much of uh, uh, Sharia would be in it and how much of uh, you know positive law would be there, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all details that would be worked out. But the mere fact that the government would be based on the law and the minimum and the basic rights of the citizens would be given to them, I think those are realistic. I do think that the, the, the Taliban would accept that. And I think doing that, the U.S. can also ensure its own presence there, uh, which then it can use to assure uh, its interests at stake. Yeah, thank you. And of course, that wouldn't be easy. I mean, we shouldn't forget that we are dealing with a regime like a very ideologic regime like the Taliban. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharifi. So I, as an action oriented person, I'm, I like action. So uh, I like to conclude our uh, discussion with some practical step uh, for moving forward. And uh, to help us with these insight, we have uh, Mr. Bill Rogio, a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of, uh, of Democracies and also an, uh, an editor for FDD's Long War Journal. So Mr. Rogio, thank you so much for joining us. You have spent years studying and analyzing the war on terror and the United U.S. Afghanistan relations. So why some believe that the U.S. lost, like you know, kind of all the leverage in Afghanistan after 2001? I I agree with Dr. Sharifi that I still see some potential areas of influence, such as economic, economic uh, sanction, financial pressure, strengthening, like, you know, diplomatic isolation, and kind of like, you know, multilateral efforts. And also, we, uh, I mean, CIGAR has... Uh, published their recent uh, report yesterday, and there is an uh, indication of some sort of relationship between the Taliban and also some uh, uh, terrorist group inside the country. So could you share some visible, impactful, realistic action that you believe that the new administration could take to prevent a regime with such kind of characteristic from like, you know, consolidating power any farther. So over to you, you have 10 minutes. Yes, thank you very much. It's an honor to join you and, and to discuss this important topic and uh, certainly some very wise uh, words spoken by my fellow, fellow panelists. Um, while the world has become a greatly uh, far more complicated place with the Russia-Ukraine war, Iran and its proxy war with Israel, Houthi shutting down transit through the Red Sea and the, the looming China threat, uh, the war on terror at countries like Afghanistan, Middle Eastern countries, they've taken a backseat, but they, they cannot be ignored. This is how we got 9-11. Uh, the threat from Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is as dire today as it was on September 10th, 2001. We ignore Afghanistan at our own peril. 
Um, I would say the Taliban, and I, I don't recall which one of the speakers said this, but I believe it was Dr. Sharifi, that the Taliban has already established, uh, consolidated its, its power. It is the predominant authority in Afghanistan. It controls all 34 provinces. Um, resistance, you know, Afghan resistance groups, their, their impact is minimal. Um, the Islamic State Khorasan province can harass the Taliban with assassinations and bombings, but it isn't a viable threat in the short to mid midterm, and nor shall, should we want the uh, ISKP to be a threat. Um, that's trading really bad for much worse. Uh, how do we know this? Al-Qaeda is running training camps um, and safe houses, media operations center, weapons storage depot, um, all in Afghanistan. 12 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces, according to the UN. I estimate it's in half of the provinces, a couple of provinces where historically Al-Qaeda is operated. They haven't been identified. Um, Al-Qaeda leaders are sheltering there currently. Some high prominent Al-Qaeda leaders who have been identified two decades ago. Um, currently, the U.S. has very little leverage uh, in Afghanistan. Um, that doesn't mean we can't regain some of it, but keep in mind how much how little leverage we had while we were there. We buckled to the Taliban with the Doha Agreement. Um, we're going to have to exert external pressure on the Taliban to regain what little leverage there is to to be gained. Um, what should the U.S. do? Um, we should chip away at the Taliban's grip on power. Uh, as Dr. Sharifi wisely noted, um, President Biden's apathy towards Afghanistan is most certainly the NADAR here. Um, I, the way I look at it, there's no, his absolute disdain for Afghanistan and its people. I, I don't see how this administration, the, the upcoming administration could be any worse than that. What can the U.S. do? Sanctions on the Taliban, designate Taliban leaders, um, that aren't designated, stop them from traveling, stop the UN from issuing waivers for Taliban to travel. Siraj Akhani, who has a $10 million bounty on his head, he's the Taliban's interior minister and uh, deputy, one of two deputy emirs, with so much blood on his hands, um, was allowed to travel to Saudi Arabia and the UAE this year, as, as well as a whole cadre of designated Taliban leaders. Um, this is painful. But we should not be permitting funds to go into Afghanistan in any way, shape, or form to prop up the banks. Even, and I hate to say this, every dollar that we give in aid to Afghanistan props up the Taliban regime. It's, this, it's a difficult pill, and it's one that we must swallow if we hope to defeat the Taliban in the long runs. Um, I disagree with Dr. Sharifi here. Stop all diplomatic engagement with the Taliban. Stop pretending that there is a so-called moderate Taliban or a Taliban that's willing to um, listen to to be reasoned with. Look, you could spot a unicorn uh, before you find that mythical beast known as a moderate Taliban. The New York Times and its uh, high Gaffrey of uh, Surajun Haqqani, notwithstanding that article, what you know is he the 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 best hope? Um, was absolutely disgraceful. Engagement only legitimizes the Taliban. And it hurts any type of um, opposition to the Taliban. That's again. This is what this is what we should have learned from Doha. Um, engaging the Taliban, it's it's a loser's game. Uh, we already lost at this game once. Um, it got us the Doha agreement and the collapse of the Afghan government. Um, we just aren't good at negotiating with our enemies. We think they operate the way we do. They think they could be influenced. They think that there's levers that we could pull that'll make them work. Um, when there is, uh, as you stated, Nazila, that the, the Taliban is ideological. Um, the Taliban will never agree to some type of constitution that codifies rights for women, that uh, for girls to go to school, etc. Um, they laughed at this during Doha, and they refused to agree to it. Um, Post-Doha should prove this once and for all. Um, the Taliban has its own constitution. It's a harsh version of Sharia law. Um, but look, you know, we, we, we're never going to have that leverage on the Taliban. Um, we, we couldn't exert leverage on the Taliban while we're in country and certainly aren't going to be able to exert it effectively while we're outside of Afghanistan. 
um, unless we do the right things. Um, we need to pressure EU countries and the UN to stop engaging Taliban, stop in issuing uh, travel. Um, the EU engaging the Taliban, it's, it's reprehensible. Um, we need to support the resistance in Afghanistan. But before this happens, the Afghan resistance, both political and military, they need to organize. They need to unify. The It's mind boggling to me that three years after the US withdrawal and the collapse of the Afghan government, that, they're, they, that the Afghans cannot speak with one voice on this issue. It really makes it difficult for those who want to support the resistance to do so. And, you know, we could sit here all day and say the U.S. should do this and the, the EU should do that and the Indians should do this. But until they unite, it's going to be very, very difficult for that support to materialize. Um, once it does, the U.S. Uh, should provide the resistance with diplomatic support with weapons, with money, and let the Afghans fight. The Afghan members of the Afghan resistance that I'd speak to, to a man say, just give us what we need and we'll take the fight to the Taliban. We don't want US boots on the ground. We don't need them. We tried it your way. Let it try, let us try it our way. Um, the US need, they, they'll say this, just get out of our way. Um, you know, allow them to hopefully establish some safe areas, show the world, show the Afghan people what it can look like in um, in an Afghanistan that the Taliban doesn't control, um, that could give the give Afghans hope for um, to you know improve their situation. Um, the U.S. also needs to strike at those Al Qaeda training camps when they pop up in, um, and do it routinely. But do with this you know as far as the military side, the support, do it in silence. It's frankly the bragging that goes on, the lack of guile that exists within the US government to, you know, it's just this need, it's it's almost narcissistic to, to brag about what we're doing. I mean, I just long for the days when we did things in silence and let's keep the Taliban guessing about how it's happening, who's supporting them. Um, I believe it was uh, you, Jason, who mentioned Pakistan, a difficult problem. Pakistan has always play, played a double game. We need to make them pay a price. And uh, to me, the best way to do this, it's India. I would provide weapons to India on the condition that they only deploy them along the border with Pakistan, um, isolate Pakistan. This is what the Pakistanis fear the most is is some is the Indians having the upper hand on them. Um, that's uh, you know I would work with India to exert pressure. Now, what will the Trump administration do? That's really anyone's guess. I think it really depends on who he surrounds himself with, and then. Once he does that, whose voice is the most influential? Um, then there's also the possibility of a, if there is a terror attack that emanates from Pakistan, from Al Qaeda or its its allies, um, that could change the calculus of the administration. I also think that there's an opportunity here, um, if this is played properly, to, you know, I I am certain that uh, President Trump would like to. Um, embarrass the Biden uh, administration a little bit, striking those camps that Al Qaeda camps, for instance, would show the world that the Biden administration was wrong when it said that Al Qaeda was defeated and defeated by the hands of the Taliban. Um, so there, there's there's ways to to get that maybe play towards President Trump's uh, narcissism or however you want to describe that. I, I do doubt that President Trump will recognize the Taliban, but when it comes to to Trump, it, you know, all bets are off. You know, I but I'll, I'll end on this. I mean, it's things look really grim right now, and they are they are extremely grim. But I do think we're at the bottom here, and there's no way but up. Afghans really need to unify. Come 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 to the administration with a single voice. There are voices that will be within this administration that I think can be influenced to support an Afghan resistance and to take the fight to the Taliban. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Mr. Rogier. You mentioned two very interesting points, and I would like to ask for some uh, a more elaboration on those. I mean, you mentioned about the uh, supporting resistance group who are also, I mean, who are kind of unorganized. They are not really organized among themselves. They really, uh, you also mentioned that they need to put really themselves together and being a little bit more inspired. And you also uh, uh, kind of connected it to supporting Mujahideen against Russia uh, many years ago. And it was when Mujahideen were very, very inspired to fight. They were already fighting with empty stomach. They were fighting already with empty hand. So all they had any kind of aspiration all they needed was some sort of support to win the war. So do you think this time among these resistant group, United States or other Western society will see that kind of aspiration? What do you think about that? Yeah, so, you know, when the, we supported the Mujahideen against the Soviet occupation, we unfortunately, our mistake was outsourcing that to Pakistan, which led to the radicalization or to the promotion of radical uh, Mujahideen groups that you know ultimately led to the civil war. Um, we definitely should not fall into that trap. The three largest resistance groups, or the really the three main resistance groups that are, that are out there, the Afghanistan United Front, the Afghanistan Freedom Front, and the National Resistance Front, are all have elements of uh, large numbers of former uh, Afghan officers who worked with the United States. Um, and all of these groups, the leaders of, of all these groups had worked with the United States. They are not um, extremists. So, but the, you know, the real issue, the division, I think is this, you know, Afghanistan seems to come to this issue of, you know, cult of personality and an unwillingness to work together at times. They need to overcome that. And if they can do that, and if the National Resistance Front was coordinating with the Afghanistan Freedom Front and the Afghan United Front, if all three of these groups could coordinate its activities, then it would show both the Afghan people that there's viable resistance and then show the world that, you know, this is something that we can and should get behind. So that's that's what needs to happen. I really think that it, it, it to get over the hump of supporting a resistance, the resistance needs to unify and they need to put, I, I'm aware of personal conf conflicts between members of one group and the other. And this Afghanistan is far bigger than the leader of this group having personality conflicts with the you know leader of that group. It's just, there's no place for this. And they're going to, it's going to be difficult to get them to, to have that support until they cast that aside. That's right. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing all this information and insight with our audience. I see some uh, questions in the chat, and uh, I highly encourage everyone among the audience, if you have any question, please feel free to leave them in the chat, and we try to respond as much as we can. So uh, one of our audience, Andres Holm, is asking, what are some activities that the United States is doing right now at the moment in Afghanistan? And wouldn't it be a good idea to work with, uh, for a good relationship with the Talib and Taliban uh, at the moment? And he also kind of adds that apart from gender discrimination, the country has become more well functioning in other areas. So uh, uh, he's not posing this uh, question to any uh, particular uh, speaker. So any of you would like to respond, please feel free. Yeah, I wonder if I could start with that. The um, the formula, apart from gender discrimination, I just, I have to say that takes my breath away. There is no apart from gender discrimination. Uh, you know, what's happening is apartheid, which we quite rightly wouldn't stand for when it happened in South Africa on a racial basis. It is destroying millions of people's lives and setting a pernicious, dangerous example for other countries around the world. There is no apart from gender discrimination. And of course, I would also argue that plenty of people are showing ways 
that Taliban are becoming more corrupt, that there are elements of the country that are not in fact functioning well. So I reject the narrative on which that question is based. Um, having said that, you know, how could we engage? I go back to this idea that we shouldn't be reinventing things if we can help it, you know, divide and conquer where each country has its own policy. It only really helps the Taliban. There was a good report from former Turkish foreign minister, Senator Leolu, one year ago that, that laid out a roadmap. And I will respectfully disagree with Dr. Sharifi. It's not up to the U.S. to come up with some sort of bargaining uh, schedule with the Taliban. They know it has been laid out through the UN what they need to do in order to someday see a normalization of ties with the rest of the world and economic you know, relief. So what they need to do is abide by their international human rights commitments. And um, the last thing I will note is that it's really important as Afghans you know, we all urge Afghans to speak with one voice, but the point is you're not going to say the same thing every month. What is it that you need now? What are you asking for today? Each day that goes by, each month that goes by, the international community has different agenda items about Afghanistan that they need to decide. So I'll just point out that it's not enough to sort of tell the American people that bad things are happening there. There also has to be a set of requests that is made and an understanding of why the requests are in the interests of the US and other countries around the world. We all need to know what is on the agenda now that Afghans overall uh, all want in common. Thank you. Can may I add to that really quickly? Um, you know, the, the the question was, you know, is, are things functioning better in Afghanistan? Well, that's because it's of the peace of the Taliban, which is not very peaceful, at least not to the Afghan people. Um, in exchange for the end of active fighting, the Afghan people are being oppressed. And that's why things may look good on the surface, but they below the surface, the Afghan people suffer daily. Well, thank you so much, both of you. So if you have another audience, as Sami Niaze, uh, asking this question, and I'm just reading it out. Uh, considering the US withdrawal and the ensuring regional instability, what role should the United States take in supporting neighboring countries uh, who are now hosting Afghan refugee. And he, in another question, he's asking, with the renewed administration, what are some realistic goals that the United States may, might set regarding human rights in Afghanistan, especially for women and minority? So uh, again, he's not uh, posing the question to any uh, specific uh, uh, speakers, so please feel free to take it, any of you who's willing to take it. Dr. Sherifi, would you like to take this uh, since uh, you talked a little bit about, like, you know, some uh, potential avenue that the United States might take? Uh, I think on the issues of uh, of refugees, uh, it might be best if Jason would take it. And I think he was going to talk about that. So Jason, would you like to go? Uh, I could talk a little bit about the, the regional dynamics because I do go. I frequent uh, to the Central Asia uh, over the past three years, part major part of my research uh, is, is focused on Central Asia. And so I do go to Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, to that part of the region quite often. And I have lots of meetings and people and others. Uh, it seems to me, and again, please uh, uh, do not misinterpret, misunderstand what I am saying. What I am saying is absolutely apolitical. Uh, I see a very pragmatic way that the countries in the region are pursuing. Like it or not, those countries are engaging with the Taliban. Now, the United States stays aside and does nothing. Uh, 
Uh, sure, let's for a minute forget about Afghanistan and forget about Afghan women and everybody else. Let's think about the United States interest. I mean, Afghanistan, yes, it's not Ukraine. It's not that important, but it still is important. I mean, the, the sheer geographical location of Afghanistan is critical for the U.S. interest there. I don't want to go into the, the military details of that or strategic details of that, but uh, but let me let me just tell you this, that uh, to my knowledge, in the entire world, there is no other country, not even a second one, that in the span of 80 years has drawn three superpowers into it, the British, the Soviets, and the Americans. So that should tell you about the geopolitical importance of the country and the United States as it is gearing up for a longer term comprehensive competition, if not confrontation with China, um, completely ignoring Afghanistan is going to be losing on the you know in the long run which is why i'm thinking only from the U even even only from the us interest perspective it is critical that the united states take some steps and secure its own interest which again would be in line to the interests of the afghan people uh, now how it would work with the countries in the region again i would like to go back i i again uh, i mean uh, annie talked about it's not up to the united states i think it is up to the united states uh, both uh, uh, from, from, from the past. I mean, how could you go into a country, get people to fight against each other for 20 years, and then wash your hands and get out? It is up to the United States to conclude that. The U.S. government sat with the Taliban in Doha, made commitments to the Afghan people and to the Taliban. The Taliban made commitments, and then those commitments have not been made. So it is up to the United States, apart from its own interests. I don't want to go into that, but it really is. Um, uh, just a one, I also wanted to just very quickly uh, say that it is very difficult also as an Afghan who grew up in Kabul uh, to really advocate for another war. Uh, I mean, let's see how, think about how how, how the, the U.S., support of the Mujahideen ended. Uh, what happened to that? And now after almost half a century of constant wars and bloodshed, it might be easy to sit here in the, the United States and say, yeah, let's uh, open up another war. Uh, but you know, for the people who are there, for the people who would suffer, for the people who would get killed and lose this, the, 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 you know, their limbs, it may not be a very attractive option. Uh, so I just wanted to put that also on the table. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jason, would you can like Can I to respond to that really quickly? If, yes. if you're not going to be, be willing to remove the Taliban by force, then you will live under the rule of the Taliban. It's that simple. They are ideologically driven. Their fight over 20 years demonstrated that. There's no negotiating with them. The Afghan people either have to fight for their freedom from the Taliban or live under the Taliban. It's that simple. I don't want that. I don't like that. But that is the harsh reality that exists. So since you are speaking, Mr. Rogia, there is a question for you uh, by Fawad Nazami, who himself, I believe, is a former diplomat. So the, the question is, the Taliban favor as, uh, isolation as it helps them maintain control uh, with minimal uh, interference from other societies, their restrictive policies, particularly against women, seem intended to push the international community away and securing their grip on power. They resist any engagement, fearing that openness could uh, destabilize their regime, uh, so showing a little uh, uh, regard for the need of ordinary Afghan. Would you like to provide any kind of response to this, please? People think that the Taliban craves legitimacy, that it wants recognition. What the Taliban want is power. They want to control Afghanistan. The easiest thing for the Taliban to do would be to feed on women's rights, on girls going to school, um, to just give a little bit, to give the international community something. But that's not what they want. Um, the Taliban don't want a constitution. You know, I, I go back to 2016. There was a statement by the Taliban. Um, I can't remember who it who said it, but it was a senior Taliban leader. There was a statement issued on Voice of Jihad, the Taliban, in English, no less, where they said, we're not, we haven't fought, we haven't sacrificed through these decade and a half for a silly ministerial post. 
what are they telling you? The Taliban were telling you at that point they will not share power. Um, they just don't view, you know, if, if you think that the Taliban are willing to give or to negotiate, you're falling into the trap, the same trap that we fell into in Doha, thinking that the Taliban was a partner that we can negotiate with. The Taliban used Doha to force, to, to affect the U.S. withdrawal. And, you know, you still have people like Zalmay Khalizade today saying that we should try and enforce the Doha agreement. It was never enforceable. The three and a half page, or it's actually three and a third page document, I signed car loans that were longer than this. There was never anything enforceable. The Taliban never intended to live to the live to the letter of the Doha agreement. All it wanted was the U.S. to leave, and it couldn't even wait for the U.S. to leave before it seized power. It did it as we were packing our bags. That just goes to show you how, what the Taliban's commitment is to our cause. If the Afghan people want to be rid of the Taliban, they're going to have to match the Taliban's commitment. It's that simple. Thank you. And Jason, if you can uh, respond to this question that I'm going to read by another audience, Graham Aiken, uh, just in two minutes or so as we are concluding the uh, webinar. So the, the question is, does the U.S. or its ally have any intelligence presence in Afghanistan today? Or is the intelligence provided by liaison relationship, for example, I, ISI? <laughs> Oh, that's an easy question. Uh, I cannot say what we are doing. Um, I, I would say that if I was advising the Trump administration, I would take a hard look at things that could be done on Inauguration Day in the afternoon after the handover of government and see how many of those terrorists that are on the sanctions lists and watch lists can be uh, taken out of Afghanistan and put where they should be. Uh, because there's there's got to be a clear message that we have tried. I've been inside all of the secret talks to the Taliban since this started <laughs> from the very beginning. I They don't negotiate. They want power. They would like international recognition just so they can get the seat at the U.N. because they yeah. that irks them that they can't have that seat. Um, but we're not going to negotiate our, our way with them. The people of Afghanistan have to organize politically, organize martially bit by bit, retake the country, reset the government. It's not easy. It's a long-term thing. This is a marathon, not a sprint. There are ways the U.S. can help, um, but there are also a lot of ways the U.S. can make it harder for the people of Afghanistan. So I think engaging other international partners um, is going to be an important part of this puzzle, uh, because if we can even get the U.S. to take interest in it, um, that will be a, a feat all of its own. Uh, let alone do anything uh, on top of that. So uh, it's it's not great news, but uh, I think it's the realistic news that the people of Afghanistan have to understand uh, and know who their enemy are and know who their friends are and try to figure it out. Well, thank you so much. Okay, so we are... Uh... We have one minute to conclude and end the webinar. So based on the discussion and the question and answer, we have here, I mean, as I uh, took note, I try to take note as much as I can. We have five main points for concluding remarks. So one is, is some level of strategic significance of Afghanistan. So despite differing approaches, Afghanistan kind of still remains uh, to some degree, a little bit of like, you know, strategically significant for the US foreign policy. And uh, while President Trump's policy such as Doha agreement kind of reflect a certain approach to engage with the Taliban, but kind of like, you know, a, a, a speaker talked about making it conditionally with no exception. So, and also uh, impact on international responses. Uh, there have been uh, some uh, insight over the US stance on Afghanistan kind of will influence the strategies of allies such as a UK and the EU to some degree, but not completely. Uh, if the United States take like, you know, hardline approaches such as imposing like, you know, a striker sanction or diplomatic isolation on the Taliban, the international 
international community, particularly the EU and UK, will likely to adjust their policies, maybe accordingly or maybe uh, uh, depending on the different uh, of uh, interest that they have. Kind of uh, the third part, uh, the third point is influence of Afghan diaspora and think tanks, which is I guess very very important. The Afghan diaspora, alongside like you know all the think tanks and advocacy organization, play a vital role in influencing U.S. policies. And our speaker talked about some good strategies uh, uh, to take. Um, Counter, uh, contracting uh, rival powers influence the U.S. must find a way to maintain a diplomatic and economic presence in Afghanistan to kind of counterbalance the growing influence of China, Russia, and Iran. And this strategy should be one of the, like, you know, uh, a very, very careful uh, kind of strategies, kind of to avoid any kind of uh, taking any action that can legitimize the regime, and also leveraging through sanction and support uh, for civil society and Afghan group and uh, resistance group. And even post 2021, the U.S. kind uh, kind of retains some leverages through tools such as economic sanction, financial pressure, and diplomatic as Relation. Additionally, like, you know, supporting a lot of civil society and alternative power structure is crucial in preventing the Taliban from consolidating even further power in, in Afghanistan. So by that, thank you so very much once again, all distinguished uh, speaker, panelists, and the audience for joining us today. And I wish everyone a very uh, happy veteran day and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.